And so there is this, this creation process that is artistic. And, and coders talk about form, structure, style of code, you know, and look at it almost like an art form. And so over time, I definitely started to see these connections and even similar language that people use when they, when they talk about an engineering creation or a piece of code versus a piece of art. Uh, so I really do think that there is a much stronger link there than people realize. Hi, welcome to the Artful Engineer. This is the episode one, numero one, and we're lucky to have uh, Jack Wiest, who is Intel Fellow, and I've known him for a long time for the uh, coverage of autonomous vehicle. But I'm happy to introduce Jack to this show. Hi, Jack. Hi, Jacko. Thanks so much for having me. All right, um, I just want to go back to the history. I want to uh, go back to. Jack was four years old or five years old. How old were you when you started uh, playing the piano? Yeah, I think it was about that age. I mean, some of my earliest memories are sitting in front of the piano, uh, plunking around with keys. Uh, it's something that was always part of my identity uh, and who I was. So from an extremely young age, uh, uh, took piano lessons, um, had a brief period in middle school where I reveled and uh, decided I was going to play violin instead, but then went back to the piano after that. So it's really always been my first love from a musical standpoint has been been with me my whole life. I read somewhere when you are actually growing up, if you are not making music, you learn to, I guess you picked up some computer magazine and you learn how to program. How did that connect each other? I'm yeah. kind of curious. Yeah, I was fortunate that my dad was a, a bit of a hobbyist um, from a computer standpoint. So I was very lucky to have uh, some very early computers around at home. And in those days, um, you used to go to the store, you know, you go grocery shopping or whatever. On the magazine rack, you had Compute Magazine. And I remember Compute Magazine because in the middle of the magazine, they had these blue phone book pages or so that were code listings. And so, you know, you'd go to the store, get your magazine with your code listing, dutifully enter it, you know, into your TI-99 or, or whatever system that you have. And then now you've got fish swimming around on the screen in a virtual fish tank. Um, and so for me, I was always fascinated with, with the art of programming uh, and with computers. And so it's true, after I got my requisite hour or two uh, a day of practicing the piano, I'd immediately run over to the computer and try to squeeze in as much time there as well. Uh, so self-taught myself how to program from those code listings uh, that were that used to be published in those magazines in, in elementary school. Uh, I was learning how to do that. Who's your favorite classical music composer? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I would say from a classical music standpoint, definitely Chopin um, from the Romantic era. Um, the songs uh, like his Nocturnes, for example, which are kind of dark and foreboding and, and music to be listened to at night, uh, I guess sort of fits with the, uh, the, the later computer scientist that stays up all night programming. But I love his music because of how it connects with you so deeply. Uh, at an emotional level, um, and that it's not just uh, playing the notes on the page, but it's how the music is interpreted through you, uh, and how every person who plays it, you know, feels it differently and plays it differently. From my mind, Music and science are really a world apart. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, but it sounds like the it, it, in your life it was more or less continuum, or mm -hmm. it's sort of you kind of stumbled into switching your major from music to computer science. I mean, was there any connection in the back of your head while you're uh, in high school, or I guess more or less in college? Did you have any inklings that, you know, these two things are connected? Yeah, you know, I don't think I did at the time, um, but the, va the fact that I was doing both in parallel is yeah. probably making those connections in my mind. And so as I reflect on it, though, I think um, what they both have in common um, is, you know, engineering is a creative 
discipline, just like the arts, uh, particularly in computer science, where uh, you can program some of the most complex structures uh, that can be created and it exists only virtually it exists only in your mind you know it's not it could, because it's code right it's not something you can physically can build you know or touch or see like a mechanical engineer might for example um, and so there is this this creation process that is artistic and and coders talk about form structure style of code you know, and look at it almost like an art form. And so over time, I definitely started to see these connections and even similar language that people use when they when they talk about an engineering creation or a piece of code versus a piece of art. Uh, and so I really do think that there is a much stronger link there than people realize. That's true. I remember that first time I was um, started working for E-Times in Silicon Valley, because English is not my first language. And some engineer explained that, well, Junko, this is a very elegant solution. <laughs> so yeah. I never thought the math was elegant, right? <laughs> yeah. Those are words often you think about, you'd say, oh, what an elegant sculpture or painting or right. something like that. So yeah. um, it's it's fascinating. I think and another observation I've had over the years from, from teaching also, uh, I teach a class at Portland State University about computer science as a profession and the legal and social and ethical implications of it. Um, and you think about computer scientists and there's sort of always this expectation that you might code all day for work, but then you go home and then the evenings and the weekends or something, you're, you're, still, you're still playing, you're still coding, you're practicing on your Raspberry Pi or, or your whatever. And so there's this sort of this, this, this drive to always create and explore uh, as a computer scientist, which is exactly the same kinds of thing you expect from an artist. You know, the artist isn't done just because they finish the performance. They go home and they play more and they create more. I want you to look back and in your career, 20 two years, that's a long time, actually, 20 years <laughs> <laughs> at Intel. Um, are there any anecdotal evidence or examples that where you thought that your musical background somehow helped you see things differently? Or even if you're not solving the problem, you have approached the problem? different from others. Can you give me some examples if you have one or two? Yeah, I think so. Um, my strength um, uh, as an engineer and as I've grown into an architect has always been at the system level and doing system architecture. Uh, and when you're looking at systems, um, you're, you're, you're taking collections of lots of different things and trying to make sense of them. Uh, and so you're looking for patterns. Um, and music, I think a lot of times is also about patterns, uh, whether it's a chord structure or you're playing an arpeggio or something like that. And so as you see patterns, you start to see how those patterns interrelate with each other. And so for me, that's, that's what a great system architect does, is they see connections between discrete elements that maybe others might not see. And I've always attributed my strength in that area to my background in music um, and the arts. And so whether it's taking a complete end-to-end -end system for an autonomous vehicle all the way to the data center and back again, where you've got literally dozens of different elements that somehow all need to work together, being able to see connections and patterns and relationships between something you do in the data center and how that affects something in the car or vice versa is something that you have only when you have a systems perspective. And I think when you're looking at a piece of music, um, it's not just about this measure or this bar. It's the whole thing in its entirety um, because music has different themes and you have themes that come back and forth into different parts of the, of the piece uh, that are interconnected and related that, that all create the whole. Um, and so for me, I, I'm grateful for the, for the background in, in arts and music because I really believe it's made me a better systems architect uh, and has directly led to my success at Intel today. <clears throat> so I just learned a couple of days ago, you became fellow at Intel, right? That's the <laughs> highest uh, um, the status you can get as an engineer at uh, Intel, right? Yeah. That's right. That's an, that's an unbelievable honor from my, uh, as I, I told, told all my coworkers when I first started as that intern back in 1997, I always dreamt of becoming an Intel fellow. So for that to happen, is just a, a truly a dream come true. Uh, and I'm so grateful for the opportunities that I've had at Intel. I've just done some amazing things, worked with some incredible people. Uh, and uh, I just love who I am today uh, because of the experiences that I've had at Intel. 
All right. So tell me um, a little bit about the, what you exactly do these days. Uh, so these days, uh, I get yeah. the pleasure of working on autonomous vehicles. Um, so we have some big challenges, both technical, um, but also from kind of a standards and regulatory standpoint. We need to figure out what does driving safely mean for a machine. Um, and so I have the honor of doing research around the world in automated vehicle safety, how to define it, how to assess it, how to measure it. Uh, I'm leading industry standards where we're documenting important elements um, that play into and contribute to the safety of automated vehicles, the IEEE uh, 2846 standard. Um, and I have the opportunity to work with uh, colleagues in our government affairs organization and meet with government officials around the world to help them understand how the technology works, why it's safe, and what an appropriate regulatory framework is uh, to allow the widespread commercial deployment of this life-saving technology. So I feel like I've got the best job on the planet uh, and uh, very lucky to have it. And it is a very challenging problem. I mean, mm -hmm. this is, to me, it is sort of almost insolvable problem, right? Teaching machines to be um, sort of, uh, uh, to drive safely or drive cautiously, you have to teach machine in the way machine understands what it means to drive cautiously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the challenge because you say something like cautious as a human sort of notion. We might know it when we see it or know it when we don't, but we can't define it precisely. But for a machine, you have to, right? You've got to precisely define what does it mean for it to drive cautiously. So there's this interesting kind of link between arts and psychology yeah. and social science, right? Because ultimately, we're asking people to trust a machine. But trust is a human emotion. The dictionary definition talks about a belief in the character or strength or truth in something, you know, and these aren't attributes that we typically apply to machines, but ultimately that's what we've got to do. So we've got to learn how to trust them and learn how to embody human intelligence in these machines so that they can drive safely in ways that we would agree they are driving safely. Yeah, that's a huge task. <laughs> I would actually like you to um, bring up, a, because I read it somewhere, that um, your experience working with um, Imaginarium for the uh, Shakespeare Company, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that you um, tell me how it came about. How did Intel get involved in the, some underlying technologies used in the Tempest actual theater? Uh, start, start with up on Avon. Tell mm -hmm. me that story. Yeah, this is a wonderful story. One of my the favorite one of my favorite projects that I've ever worked on at Intel. So a colleague of mine, uh, Tani Shalevsky, and I, who had a background in theater arts, were considering from a research standpoint, um, what would an unconstrained computer be? Traditional computing architectures based on the von Neumann approach separate memory, compute, and storage in sort of a hierarchy. Um, and that hierarchy, you know, we all experience on a daily basis when our system has to go to the hard drive and bring in memory pages into RAM and these kinds of things. Um, and so we started thinking about what if those constraints were gone? What if these sort of traditional limitations of computer systems didn't exist anymore? Um, who would benefit from that? And what would they do with it? And so we started looking around and we found uh, in the creative industries in particular, um, special effects companies, for example, um, are really challenged because for an artist who's, who's drawing and, and generating uh, computer animations, for example, it can take sometimes hours or even days for them to see the result of their work. And so that feedback loop for an artist, imagine being a painter on a canvas and having to wait hours or a weekend to see what your paint stroke looked like. Um, but that's the experience of many of, many of these, these creatives. Uh, and so in talking with these companies, we ended up uh, getting connected to Imaginarium based in the UK, and that led us to the Royal Shakespeare Company, which was considering a production of The Tempest, which has always been for centuries uh, Shakespeare's play where theater companies show off their latest technical innovations. And so we thought, wouldn't it be amazing uh, to be able to close that feedback loop so much so that you could do real time motion capture, computer generation and reprojection back onto the same stage to the same character uh, in a live theater 
performance. Nothing pre-recorded, nothing pre-generated. Um, and that's what we did. Uh, as far as we know, it's the first time in history that's been done. Uh, and it was an unbelievable achievement and one of the great honors of my life to work with Gregory Doran and the rest of the folks at the Royal Shakespeare Company. All right. All right. Um, it, it seems like you have very strong, you know, issues about the current STEM movement, which seems to be, in your opinion, not going into the right direction. So tell me, what's your objection? What's the, what do you expect the STEM to become? Yeah, I think um, first, for sure, we need more scientists and engineers and mathematicians in this country. Um, but if we do so at the expense of the arts, I think we lose something along the way. Uh, and so I think, as you've probably seen, there's sort of a STEAM movement, right, to add the A, the arts, back into science and math education. Because as we've been discussing, there is a link, there is a relationship, you know, um, music is a even even how you write music is really not all that different than mathematical expressions because that's basically what it is um, and engineering is a creative discipline and the arts are where kids learn how to create and be creative and so if we don't include that uh, as part of that stem curriculum uh, you might have um, uh, fantastic engineers that can do sort of amazing uh, calculations of existing things but when you're talking about creation and innovation those muscles come from the arts uh, and practicing and creating and playing. And so that's why I believe very strongly that we need to have uh, STEAM education as, as some have, have suggested. I heard about the secret rock band that you have. So <laughs> tell me about that, uh, who are in it, what's his name and what do you play actually? And when do you play? Yeah, unfortunately, in COVID, we're not getting a chance to play very much. Um, but after I changed my major to computer science, I said, you know, I need an instrument that's portable because I'm not going to have access to the practice rooms anymore in the music department to go play the piano. So let's pick up guitar. Uh, so I taught myself how to play guitar. I'd always sang as well uh, as a kid uh, in, in church choirs and things like that. And so combined those two things together, recruited some friends and have been a, a variety of different bands over the years. Uh, one of our first bands name was Psycho Pop, uh, but it, it's a, it was a great friend of mine, Andy Grover, who's out there. Uh, and uh, also played in bands with co-workers. Uh, my former boss, Alan Crouch, and I uh, put together a band where we played a concert for some of our, our employees just as a fun way to celebrate. Uh, but for me, you know, a, a band is, is just as fun as it looks, honestly. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a creative outlet, but it's also a way to have a great time. Uh, and so for me, it's a, it's a fun way to let your hair down uh, and, and just jam out, uh, play music really loud, uh, and scream into a microphone and have a lot of fun. Excellent. All right. No, this was uh, really lots of fun. Thank you for coming to the show, Jack. It's been a pleasure and an honor, Junko. Thank you so much.